Parashat Zvayachi, in a Sefer Torah, you know there are spaces that separate the columns of text into paragraphs. And uh, those spaces are called parshiyas, which is a bit of a misnomer. The parsha really is the paragraph. The spaces, the space between the paragraphs, but the spaces can be called parshiyas. And there are two types of spaces. There's the parsha stuma, which is a space in the middle of a line. In other words, the first paragraph ends a couple of words into the line, then there's a space, and the next paragraph begins at the end of the line. And then there's the parsha psucha, where the paragraph ends in the middle of the line, the, left, the rest of the line is left blank, and the next paragraph begins on the next line. Normally, the weekly portions all end at a parsha, they end at a space, which makes sense. In other words, you end the weekly portion at the end of a paragraph. So usually, the end of a parsha either is a parsha psucha or a parsha stuma. <coughs> either the rest of the line is blank or there's a space in the middle of the line. And uh, that's why in the Chumash, at the end of a parsha, I don't know if the art school is that way, but the older Chumashim <laughs> will end with a samach, 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 which means that it's a parsha stuma, or a pei, 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 which means it's a parsha psucha. Vayechi, the weekly portion of Vayechi does not begin with a new paragraph. The last pasuk of Vayigash goes right into the first word of Vayechi. And uh, Rashi believes this is noteworthy. The fact that Rashi believes it's noteworthy, it's based on the Medrash, is it itself noteworthy because um, it's not clear historically when the weekly portions were divided. Was this division already in place in the times of Chazal? Is it subsequent to Chazal? The truth is, there is a proof from the Gemara in Megillah that the weekly divisions as we have them already existed in the time of Chazal. Because Chazal speak about the unusual case of uh, Parsha Shkolim, which is the beginning of Parsha Skisisa. What do you do if it falls out on the weekly portion of Parsha Skisisa? Do you read it twice? So apparently the divisions already existed as we know them. So Parsha Svechi already was the starting point of a new weekly portion, and there's, strangely enough, no space. There's no space for Vayigash and Vayechi. So Rashi brings the Medrash to ask the question, why is that? Why is the space closed? And uh, Rashi says this is because uh, in Parshas Vayechi we have the beginning of the Golos Mitzrayim, and it was Nistumu a Nehem Velibim She Yisrael, the hearts of the Jews, the eyes and the hearts of the Jews were closed because of the tsara, because of the difficulty of the oppression. So it was closed closed. What does the closing of the Parsha symbolize? What does it mean? Nistum, their eyes and their hearts were, were closed. And what could this mean? How does the closing of the Parsha somehow symbolize this? Okay, let's put this in the back burner for a moment. There's another interesting thing later in the Parsha. It says that Yaakov Avinu, before he died, gathered his children together, and it says, Bikesh Yaakov Avinu legalos sakes. Yaakov Inu wanted to reveal the end. What to reveal the end? <laughs> Meaning the end of Jewish history. When the ultimate redemption would be, when Mashiach would come. And uh, how do we know this? Because Yaakov said, gather and I will tell you what will happen by Akris Hayam. I'll tell you what will happen in the end of days. The end of days usually is an expression which refers to the Messianic age. So that was Yaakov's intention. But uh, he never does. He gives them blessings, but he never reveals to them a case. So Rashi says it was concealed from him. It was concealed from him. And the question is this. Why did Jacob want to give them, in advance, a uh, overview of the entire course of Jewish history? And he's going to tell them exactly when Mashiach is going to come, when the Messianic age will be, how it will end. What's the point? And the idea is like this. You know, in Golos, there are two aspects. There are the tribulations of Golos. It's not easy to be strangers in a strange land. Often in Golos we're oppressed, persecuted, tormented. So there are physical afflictions associated with Golos. But also there's something else which happens in Golos. It's the 
meaninglessness of it, our inability to understand it, which is especially painful. And this is, by the way, not only true about God, it's true about all forms of suffering. Because human beings are resilient, because they can bear pain if it makes sense, if it has meaning. The meaninglessness of suffering is really the problem. Because why? If we have an answer to that question, the pain we can live with. Uh, you know, I'm often uh, fond of quoting the uh, writings of uh, Viktor Frankl, the famous Viennese uh, psychiatrist, who uh, wrote a book called the Man in Search of Meaning, which is exactly this idea that what man really is looking for is not necessarily relief from pain, but he's looking for meaning. If he can give meaning to his pain, then he can bear it. So he tells the story, just one small illustration, of a patient in his practice who uh, lost his wife and was very, very distraught, very, very upset. It was a very terrible loss for him. They were very much in love and had a wonderful marriage. And he really was, was just a basket case. He was totally beside himself. So uh, he was brought to Dr. Frankel. And Dr. Frankel asked him a very simple question. He said, tell me, he says, what would have happened had you died first? Like, how would your wife have uh, lived with that? So he says, she would have been terribly broken. So he says, so just look at it this way, that you're surviving her, spared her that misery. And that's all he needed to hear. Once he heard that, he was fine. Now there's a reason. Now I understand why. In other words, it wasn't the pain, the loneliness, the inability to take care of himself that was the problem. The problem was the understanding. What, meaning, what purpose does it have? The ones who give it purpose, it becomes bearable. So these are the two aspects of all suffering. The, the suffering itself and the inability to understand why, which makes it difficult to cope with, difficult to bear. And God was the same way. So Yaakov Avinu wanted to help his children. He said, listen, I can't spare you from Golos. Golos is going to be a part of Jewish history. But at least I can give you the meaning, the explanation. Why it's going to happen. And how it's going to end. In other words, because the Giloi HaKetz, the revelation of the Ketz, isn't just a date. It doesn't mean that Yaakov was going to reveal to them the date. It's going to be at such and such time and such and such day and such and such year. Revealing the caves means he's going to explain the entire course of human history, of Jewish history, and exactly why it is Mashiach is going to come at that time. So it's not just we know the caves, it's we know why it's the caves. We know why it's then, because we know exactly what had to happen over the course of Jewish history, and when it would happen, and this is when it would come to a successful conclusion. So it would be a tremendous relief for them. That's really why Akadosh Baruch didn't want them to reveal it. Because since there was a Gezeir as Golos, there was a decree of Golos, Akadosh Baruch determined part of that Gezeir is precisely the not knowing. And the Yaakov would have undermined that by revealing the case. So therefore Akadosh Baruch concealed it from Yaakov. At that point, Yaakov couldn't tell it either. <coughs> but this is the idea that not understanding makes it painful. Chazal says, Rashi, in the beginning of Sefer Vayikra, why are there paragraph breaks in the Sefer Torah? Why are there these breaks? So Rashi says a very interesting thing. That these breaks were the points at which God paused in his teaching Torah to Moshe Rabbeinu. When God taught the Torah, when he dictated the Torah to Moshe Rabbeinu, he dictated a paragraph and he paused. And the graphic representation of those pauses are the spaces in the Sefer Torah. But really, they represent <laughs> the pauses in God's dictation. Once he dictated a paragraph, there was a pause. Another paragraph, a pause. Another paragraph, a pause. So those pauses are graphically uh, shown in the Sefer Torah as spaces. So Rashi asks the question, so why are there spaces? Why did the Torah make spaces? So Rashi says, they need to revach with his boy name in order to give a, an opportunity for understanding. 
So the Gadi Baruch Hu taught Moshe Rabbeinu a section, and then there was a pause. To allow it to sink in, to understand it, to think about it. That's what the pauses are for. So the pauses symbolize understanding. They symbolize understanding. The spaces. Does it imply that where there are spaces that there is oral Torah that needs to be learned? It may be. It may be. It may be that uh, the reason there is a pause for understanding because is because there is supplementary information. But it, not necessarily so. It could simply be because uh, you, know, you learn something, it has to percolate, it has to sink in, you have to think about it. You know, it's not as soon as you hear it, all of a sudden it impresses it itself upon your thinking at uh, full depth. You have to think and, and let it sit. And, you know, maybe weeks later and, and, and maybe months later, maybe years later, you fully realize its import. Now there's an amazing pasuk from Chumash. It says that at the end of the 40 years, Moshe Rabbeinu told the Jewish people, the Hashem lochem, that despite all the miracles that happened 40 years before, you didn't have a heart with which to understand, or eyes with which to see, or ears with which to hear, until this day. It was never, you never really understood it all until now. So the Gemara says, from here you see, a person doesn't understand his Rebbe's teachings for 40 years. It takes 40 years. So it really sinks in. Now, if the Rebbe is 40 years older than you, it certainly makes sense. Now, let's say, for example, you're 20 and your Rebbe is 60. And he tells you something. So he's telling this to you from a perspective of a 60-year-old. So how can you understand it until you're 60? You certainly can't understand it. But even if your Rebbe isn't 40 years apart, it still takes 40 years. Because to, to understand an idea deeply, fully, it takes time to... You know, I, I know myself, there are things that I learned from my day, and I'm not quite 40 years removed from them, but getting there. And uh, it's only now I realize, oh yeah, that, that made sense. I appreciate them now. I didn't appreciate them at the time. You know, I, I joke... Um, when I was a young boy in yeshiva, I was a little wild. I don't know if you want to view this in the video. I was a little wild. I, I, I got into my fair share of trouble. So uh, I had a Rebbe who once said to me, if I were you, I would learn Musa three hours a day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ethical works three hours a day. So he told me, I was also a bright boy, he says, a boy with your intellectual baggage should develop the year of mind to go along with it. <laughs> 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 I was so angry! <laughs> How did he say anything like that? Mm -hmm. But you know, years later I said, you know, he was right. If I were to listen to his advice, I'd be a better person. So there's certain things that you just can't understand at the time. It takes time to sink in. So there were a little bird he's the best teacher. But he gave Moshe Rabbeinu you know, these pauses to, to think and to reflect and let it sink in somewhat. So that's what the spaces symbolize. The spaces correspond to the pauses. The nature of Golos is its being inexplicable. That's the nature of the experience of Golos. That's Yaakov Avinu wanted to explain it to his children, and God said no, because Golos has to be inexplicable. And therefore, the beginning of Pashas Vayechi, which is the beginning of the Golos Mitzrayim, has no space, because the space symbolizes understanding. But here there is no understanding, so there's no space. But the interesting thing is this. It is, it's a fantastic Arachayim, and the first word of the parasha. It says, Vayechi Yaakov Beretz Mitzrayim Shvaz Vayishana. The Yaakov lived in Eretz Mitzrayim for 17 years. So, if you put the accent on the word lived, it comes out like this. Yaakov lived in Mitzrayim for 17 years. He lived in Mitzrayim. Now, we know that Yaakov lived to 147 years. 
He came to Mitzrayim to be reunited with Yosef when he was 130. At that point, his life was absolutely wretched. Whereas in last week's parasha, you know, Paro takes one look at him, and he says, how old are you? And Ramban says, it wasn't just chit-chat. I never saw a person who looks so old in his life. So he must be 300 years old. He looked terrible. But no, not so old. Only 130 years old. Which, in my family, is not that old. Because, uh, Baruch Hashem, my family, we're blessed with longevity. Abraham Avinu lived 175, and Yitzchak lived 180, and I'm only 130. So not that old. I said, ah, it's why do I look the way I look? Because I had a hard life. A very, very hard life. A lot of tsars. A lot of tsars. We don't appreciate the tsars because uh, if we'd ask, well, how long we act of tsars? Yeah, about 300 percent. <laughs> we don't think of them in terms of time. Right? We figure, you know, you can read a parsha about a half hour, so it's an hour and a half. An hour and a half of tsars. But you know, there were years and years and years and years of tsars being pursued by Esau and, and the love on them and having these beloved yells they've taken from him for 22 years. And was, he had a terrible, terribly hard, crushing life. And now, it's beautiful, says the Rachayim. He's reunited with Yosef, the family is together, all the Tsaras are over. Vayechi Yaakov there, he lived. He lived in Messiah. These were the, the years that he really lived, more than any other time in his life. And of course, the number 17 is significant, because the number 17 is the gematria of the word Tov. Tov is the gematria of 17, which means good. So these are the good years, the 17 <coughs> good years. And of course, he died when he was 147. Which was substantially younger than Abraham and, and uh, Yitzchak. But in any case, it says Yaakov lived. But for the children, this Rashi says this was the beginning of the Gaul, they understood this. And it was at this point, this is the point of their eyes and hearts becoming closed. So what's going on? That they are beginning to suffer, they understand that they're not where they belong. And this is the beginning of Golos. And Yaakov was having a grand time. Vayechi, he was living it up. And the Svas Emes talks about this. And the Svas Emes says an amazing thing. He says, because a person who lives with the Emes, a person who lives with truth, of course, Emes is the hallmark of Yaakov Avinu, never experiences the bitterness of Golos. Svas Emes says this. What does it mean? What does it mean? And it really means this, that, that if you understand and you know and you see things as they truly are, then even Gullus is bearable. If you don't understand, that's when Gullus becomes painful. Now keep in mind, it says that Yaakov Avinu wanted to reveal the case. When he was about to let it out of his mouth, HaKadosh Baruch Hu concealed it from him. But the implication is that until that point, until the point he wanted to reveal it, he knew it. When was it taken from him? At the point that he wanted to reveal it to his children, that's when it was taken away from him. But until that point, he had it. So Yaakov Avinu came down to Mitzrayim, he understood everything. Why it had to be this way, and what Golos was meant to accomplish, and the whole course of Jewish history, and when Mashiach would come, Yaakov understood everything. So Yaakov could be a Mitzrayim. It had meaning for him. And therefore he was able to live. He was able to live. He says, but for the children, this is the beginning of Golos. This is the beginning of Golos. They understand that this is not where they're supposed to be. Now, needless to say, you can get used to things very easily. And uh, if it wasn't the Shvatim, certainly their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren got used to it very, very fast. And this became the danger of assimilation. They, they began to feel at home. Isn't there an, maybe a simpler reason that, you know, Yaakov is reunited with the boy that he loves so much. And he sees, you know, he's, he has Shvat. His son is who he is, right? The brothers are living in terror. What if you know, Yosef decides, now I'm going to do a purge. The day the father dies, they're still worried. 
Yeah, but Rashi doesn't say that. They have reason Rashi to doesn't say worried. it's true. They were scared of Yosef. Rashi doesn't say that's the meaning of the parsha. He says the star of Hashem it was the Golos Mitzrayim. Because you're right, they had a lot to worry about besides Mitzrayim. Yeah. But 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 it doesn't say they were worried about Yosef. That's not why the space is missing. It's true. Later on, we see that. But that wasn't the concern which the Torah is hinting to. So Yaakov understood everything. Yaakov knew exactly what's going on. This information was not yet concealed from him. So Yaakov lived. He's able to live. So the children couldn't live. Well, I'll mention something interesting about getting used to things. My Rosh Hashim is a kind of bracha. He used to give a bracha to people. We promise a lot of them should save you from the things you can get used to. It's a very good bracha. It's a good bracha. You know, you can get used to pretty bad things. So the bracha should save you from the things you can get used to. And it's interesting, the Sfasema says a very similar thing in Parashas um, Vo'era. When God says, Vo'tseisi eschem mitachas sivlos Mitzrayim, I'll take you out from under the burdens of Mitzrayim. Which sivlos means burdens, but lisbo also means to, to tolerate something, to bear something. And God says, I will take you out from the things that you have tolerated, things you've gotten used to. In other words, they were enslaved in the time and they got used to it. Certain aspects of it. But God says, I will take you out from under the things you've tolerated, that you've accepted in the time. And that's uh, a very, very important aspect of, of redemption. So Yaakov, on the one hand, who understands, he lives. But this is the beginning of the, the Gulfs. Now, Yaakov Avinu employs a tremendous strategy, I believe, in this week's parsha, as one of the preparations for, for Golos. So the challenge of Golos is uh, manyfold. How do we prevent ourselves from assimilation? But one of the things is how do we maintain our connection to Eretz Israel? How do we maintain our connection to Eretz Israel? And this is a very, very serious question. And it's an especially serious question today for us as uh, religious Jews. As religious Jews. You know, there is a tendency in the religious life um, <coughs> when we find ourselves having to counter something, we go to the opposite extreme. We, we know this, right? In other words, if there's a force in Jewish life which we find alien, something we have to uh, contend with, so we go to the other extreme. I once had an amazing conversation with uh, Eliyahu Essas, who was uh, one of the uh, great Russian refuseniks and teachers of Torah in the Soviet Union in the days of uh, the Iron Curtain. And he said an amazing thing. He said an amazing thing that uh, he was a very, very, very strong opponent of uh, Messianism in Chabad. But you may know that in Chabad there is this uh, train of thought where uh, a lot of emphasis is placed on activity to bring Mashiach. And there's a lot of preoccupation with Mashiach and so on and so forth. He was a very, very bitter opponent of it. Um, and and, and he, he really was, uh, you know, emotionally upset about it um, in a way that uh, seemed to me uh, almost irrational. Like, what, what bothers him? Let him do their thing. What, what do you care? So he said like this. He said that in the Soviet Union, in the darkest days, the days when the Iron Curtain was in place and uh, leaving seemed almost impossible. It was the only hope, the only thing that, that sustained them was the hope in the coming of Mashiach, the possibility of redemption. And uh, he said that uh, as a consequence of, of Messianism in Chabad, the uh, mainstream orthodoxy has totally de-emphasized the idea of Mashiach. I don't think he lip service to the idea, but he believed that uh, it became, you know, the M word. You don't want to mention <laughs> it's something that uh, you know this is not. We don't talk about this. We don't uh, think about it. We don't work toward it. It's something which is 
And it was something which was very precious to him personally, the belief in Mashiach. So he was upset about the fact that one movement led to its the emphasis in mainstream Judaism. It was a very interesting conversation. Like, I remember where we even had the conversation. It was just uh, very, very intriguing. Now, the truth is this. The truth is that uh, you know that in the history of, uh, of uh, orthodoxy, if you go back to um, you know, the early part of the 20th century, um, Zionism was a uh, a very controversial cause. It was essentially a secular movement, a political movement, and uh, because it was, in a sense, a messianic movement, it was a movement that was focused on creating a uh, Jewish utopia, a secular one, so it was something that uh, had a tremendous amount of drawing power, uh, drawing idealistic youth toward it. And uh, in the yeshivas, it was something that had to be fought, secular Zionism. And uh, the way it was fought was by emphasizing everything else other than Eretz Yisrael. There was Eretz Yisrael became very, very de-emphasized in the curriculum and the hashkafa of the yeshivas, it seems, for, for a while. Um, even to the extent that uh, one of the great Rosh Yeshiva of the time wrote something which is uh, you know, amazingly uh, perplexing, we have to understand the historical context in which he wrote it, which is that why was Avram Avinu not born in Eretz Yisrael? Well, if Eretz Yisrael was our place, we would expect that Avram Avinu should have come from there. So he wrote that this teaches us that you could be a good Jew outside of Eretz Yisrael too. <laughs> this is such a bizarre statement. But this is the idea that, that the secular movement happened before, so they went to the other extreme, and, and Eretz Yisrael really became, became not central to the, the Hashkafa in the world of the yeshivas. Um, so how do you maintain your attachment to it? We've come full circle nowadays. Now, nowadays, in the modern world of the yeshivas, Eretz Yisrael is extremely central. Words, there is no yeshiva student virtual yeshiva student who doesn't have some experience in Eretz Yisrael. You know, we go to the yeshivas across the spectrum from uh, ultra traditional to ultra modern and there is not a young man or a young woman who doesn't have a period of time they spend in Eretz Yisrael as part of their chinuch. Whether it's a year, two years, three years, five years, whatever it is. In other words, you know, if you meet a person who did not spend time in the Eretz Yisrael, it's like, he's the odd man out. Like, how did that happen? Oh, you know, uh, you know uh, maybe he was sick or his parents were bankrupt or something like that. But, you know, generally, you know, if it's not 99%, it's only 95%, it seems, of, of the kids spend time in the Eretz Yisrael nowadays, right? It seems like that. So we've come full circle on that. But uh, this is a challenge. The challenge is maintaining a connection to Eretz Yisrael. And, and we do it by sending our children here. Because we have a connection because our children are there. When our children are there, we listen to the news differently. And it's not the same thing. You know, you hear about a uh, bombing. You hear about a chas uh, v'shalom. Uh, catastrophe, then uh, it, it, the news sounds different when you have loved ones there. But Yaakov Avinu has the same challenge. How is he going to maintain this connection to Eretz Yisrael? So, listen to what happens. He calls Yosef in and he says, I'm about to die. I'll know sick brain of Messiah. Don't bury me in Messiah. Just take me there to self bury. Now, why does Yaakov Avinu want this? Now, there is a, a Chazal, the Goran Sobis, that says, Rashi quotes it, that uh, Yaakov Avinu had three reasons why he wanted to be buried in Eretz Yisrael, not in Mitzrayim. Number one, because he knew that the dirt of Mitzrayim was going to turn into lice, one of the ten plagues. This would have resulted in his grave becoming uncovered, and to avoid that, he wanted to be buried in Eretz Yisrael. That's one explanation. 
The other explanation is because um, since his coming was the end of the famine, there was a fear that he'd be worshipped, his burial place would become a shrine, so therefore he didn't want that to happen, so he wanted to be buried in Eretz Israel. Another explanation is because when the Tchias Mason comes, all the bones of the dead have to roll in uh, tunnels because the resurrection will only take place in Eretz Israel, and that's very painful. And therefore, to avoid that, Yaakov wanted to be buried in Eretz Israel specifically. So these are the three reasons. But if you look in the parasha, kind of stares in the face, it seems that there was a totally different chesed. Look what Yaakov even says, what his words are. He says, I will lie with my fathers, and you will carry me from Mitzrayim, and you will bury me in their graves. In other words, there is an insistence not only to be buried in Eretz Yisrael, but to be buried specifically in the burial place of his forefathers, the Maras Machpelah. And to that, Yosef says, Anochia said, Baracha, I'll do as you say. In other words, it's not so much a Yaakov wants to be buried in Eretz Yisrael. He wants to be buried where his forefathers are buried, in the Maras Machpelah. If Yosef would have buried him somewhere else in Eretz Yisrael, that wouldn't have been the point. The point is to be buried where his forefathers were buried. Now, the question here is this, that what is the idea of this burial place? Because Avraham Avinu spent a lot of money and exerted a lot of effort to purchase the Maras and Like, why is, why is this uh, so important? You know, the idea is this. The idea is that the family burial site in a sense, is a family shrine. Or this is a place where we go to connect to our forebears, to those that came before us. And that's what everyone wanted to establish. Everyone wanted to establish it, and there it's so there should be a place. This is the burial place of the founders of the nation. This is a place to which people would go, people would pray, people would feel an attachment, a connection. And this is how we create a linkage it spans the generations by enshrining the burial place of the elders. When you think about it, you ask people, uh, how many people know their great-grandparents? You know who they were, their great-great-grandparents, or their great-great-great-grandparents? Well, virtually nobody knows. I mean, is there any nation in the world that has such a long memory as Claudius Yisrael? I don't think so. I don't think there's, there's any group that even makes the claim that we can trace ourselves back 3,000 years, 3,300 years. Is there? To specific people? Because I know that uh, if you're uh, British, you say, uh, I'm a descendant of the uh, Norman conquerors uh, <laughs> in 1066 or whatever. Uh, I don't think you can go much farther back than that. I still don't think you can trace yourself to specific people, is there? Or even make the claim that you're related to people that you can name, that you can name. That's a very, very deep level of attachment. We might miss a few of the intermediate steps, but, but we're making the claim that we know exactly who our great, 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 great grandfathers were. We know where they're buried, and we pray there when we can. That, that's a very, very deep attachment. And if that's in a specific place, that creates an attachment to that place, too. That's Eretz Yisrael. That was Yaakovina's intention. Now, Yosef compounded that. So the Shalom Kaddish says an amazing thing. That when uh, Yosef says to Yaakov, Anochi asekid barecha, I will do as you say, the Shlach Kaddish says that what Yosef was saying is, I'm going to do the same thing when I die. Not just, I will do what you say to bury you in Eretz Yisrael. Well. I'm going to do the same thing that you're saying, that when it comes my time, I'm also going to insist on being buried in Eretz Yisrael. Well. And that, we you know, also happens at the end of the parasha. Yosef tells his brothers, 
take me there to sell. But Yosef does something even more than that. Yosef doesn't say, take me now. Yosef says, Pakod Yivkod Elohim Eschem, God will redeem you from here, and then you'll take my bones. Now this is an interesting thing. You might say, well, now that Yosef is gone, who has the, the power? Yosef was the viceroy of Egypt. He could get permission from Paro to make this trip there itself. Well, once Yosef is gone, I don't know. I don't think that's an obstacle. I think Yosef could have arranged that. If Yosef would have left a will that uh, I should be buried in Eretz Yisrael immediately, probably uh, it could have been arranged. I think Yosef had a different kavana. Yosef's intention was like this. But the Mishnah says in Masechus Brachas that Misha Mason look lefanav. If you have a loved one who is unburied before the funeral, you are exempt from Kriyashma, you are exempt from Tefillin, you are exempt from davening, you are exempt from reciting blessings. That's called an Onay. No obligations at all, no mitzvahs at all. You're meant to be focused 100% on the obligation to bury the loved one. To the extent that the Torah exempts you from everything else. There's an amazing story I once uh, read. There's a book about judging people favorably, being down the kafschus. So there's a story. There was a fellow on a plane. He was on a plane from uh, New York to Eretz Israel. And they you know, on the plane. He looked around, he see also on the plane. So he saw there was a rabbinical figure on the plane. A oh, man dressed very dignified, big beard. So he figures it must be a big rabbi. He's going to watch and see what he does on the flight. So he sees that uh, you think, oh, big rabbi, he's going to say to him, he's going to learn Gemara. Right? He sees that he's uh, looking through the magazines. And uh, they make a name on the plane. He doesn't dive him. He doesn't put on film. Right? They serve the meal. He doesn't say any brachas. He doesn't bench <laughs> afterward. Did you get you a kosher meal? <laughs> Had a kosher meal. Had a kosher meal. Right? And he says, this rabbi is an uh, imposter. Because, you know, uh, I'm sure back in New York, you know, he, he acts like uh, the tzaddik hadar. But when he's on the plane, when no one is watching, right, he's like a, like a Gentile. And uh, you know, the, the, this observer is becoming more and more esteemed, more and more incensed, just can't take it, until finally they land in the Gurion. And he gets off the plane, and there are many people who come to greet him. And it turned out that he was bringing his mother for burial in Eretz Israel. Because he was an owning, and the lack of an owning is, and not only is he exempt, by the way, he's not allowed to perform this. Right. right? So the hours in the plane accompanying the body, <laughs> he wasn't allowed to die, but it was not say it was not to enter. So uh, from here you learn that you have to judge people favorably. You know, something is very difficult. Let's mention that as an aside. But the idea is, when there's someone unburied, then, then nothing else is important. The one thing that's important is you have this unburied person. What Yosef wanted to do was to create this idea, right, that as long as the Jews were in Mitzrayim, there was unfinished business. There was something that had to be done. The body of Yosef is unburied. It has to be brought back to Eretz Israel. Until it's brought back to Eretz Israel, we're not at ease. We can't relax. We can't rest. It's an ingenious strategy to, to maintain a, this connection to to Eretz Yisrael. And that's, of course, the strategy for survival in Gullus. We can't have that Jews begin to think that Mitzrayim is our home. They have to understand there's a connection to Eretz Yisrael. This, I believe, is the strategy of Yaakov and, and Yosef. There's a little word I'd like to share with you. It's perhaps a little bit related to this. We know that uh, Yaakov Avinu, in this week's parsha, confers the Bechorah on Yosef. You know, one of the halachas of the Bechorah is that you get a double portion in Eretz Yisrael. And really it was meant to be given to Ruvain. It was taken away from Ruvain because Ruvain committed sins in a very uh, impulsive way. And uh, it was given to Yosef. The double portion was given to Yosef. But it was given in a very unusual way. It was given 
by promoting Yosef's two sons to the level of Shvatim. So Yaakov says that Ephraim and Menashe Kuruven Veshimani Yuli. That Ephraim and Menashe will be counted among the number of tribes just like Ruven and Shimon. So therefore Yosef has two tribes and thus two portions, whereas each of the other Shvatim only has one portion. That's what Yaakov did. It says in the Chumash that when Yaakov blessed Ephraim and Menashe, he said uh, that through you, Jews will bless their children. And they'll say, Yisimcha Eleikim Ke Ephraim Bechem Menashe. When parents will bless their children, they will say, God should make you like Ephraim and Menashe. Now this is a very, very perplexing thing. I mean, there were many, many great people. Jewish history, Abraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Moshe, Rabbeinu, right? Of all the people that we bless our children, you should be like someone, you should be like Ephraim and Menashe. And what do we know about them? What was, what was so outstanding about them? Now it's interesting, the Torah doesn't give us a blessing for girls. So, uh, when whoever, the unknown um, author, had to make up a blessing for girls, so uh, the author wrote, Yisimei Chalukim, Kisara V'Rivka V'Rachel V'Leia. God should make you like Sara and Rivka and Rachel and Leia. Which makes perfect sense. These are the four emails, the, the four matriarchs. So we would have expected that uh, for boys, we should say, Yisimei Chalukim, Ke Avram Yisimei V'Yakim. And what well, was the prime of Menashe? I once heard a thought from a footnote, Zeh Chassadu Bedracha, which is a very, very beautiful thought. It's like this. It is a Gemara Masechus Kedushin, which says, Kol HaMelameid Ben Beno Torah. If a person teaches his grandson Torah, Ma'ala Ola Vakasav is considered Ki'ilu Kiblo Mehar Sinai. It's considered as if he received it from Har Sinai. Because it says in the Pasuk, Vaidatam Levonecha Ovelovnei Vanecha, you should make the words of Torah known to your children and to your grandchildren. Then it says, well, after that, the day that you stood before God at Har Sinai. So from here we see if you teach your grandson Torah, it's as if he received it from Har Sinai. Who received it? The grandfather or the grandson? So the Marsha says it means the grandson. Because if a grandfather teaches his grandson Torah, it's as if the grandson received it from Har Sinai. Why should that be? Like, what is so special about teaching your grandson Torah that it should be as if the grandson then received it from Asina? So Rav Hutner, Zeich HaTzadik Lebrach, said like this, you know that there's a concept in Jewish thought called Yerida Sadoras. There's the descent of generations. Because as we drift farther and farther away from Asina, we lose clarity, we lose perspective, and uh, we know less. The closer you are to Har Sinai, the more you know, the more authentic is your Torah knowledge. The farther away, uh, the, the, the more cloudy it becomes, the, the more vague it becomes. That's a reality. But we know that in Jewish history, there are times where it isn't just a slight drift. It's like a plummet. And we know, for example, there are stages in... Uh, in the rabbinic literature. We have the time of the Mishnah. And the, the sages of the Mishnah were called Tanoim. And we have uh, the Gemara. And the sages of the Gemara called Amoraim. And then you have, post the writing of the Gemara, you have the Gaonim. And then after that, you have the time of the Rishonim. And then after that, you have the time of the Achronim. And there's a general consensus that the people of one era <coughs> cannot argue with the sages of an earlier era. Within your era, you can argue. But to argue with the sages of an earlier era, that you can't do. You can strive to understand what they say, but not to disagree. Because what's the idea? Because, you know, generally, there's a gradual descent. So, for example, you know, uh, people nowadays are probably not as great as the great rabbis that were in... Uh, uh, Europe in the 1800s. But if on a given topic you sit, you do research, you study it well, 
spend a lot of time, you really delve into it, you, you may be able to disagree. Even with the Chassam Seifer, who lived uh, 150 years ago. It's possible. It doesn't mean you're as great as the Chassam Seifer. The Chassam Seifer would probably spend about five seconds on the subject, right? And if you spend 20 hours, you may be able to have an idea which uh, it varies from the Chassam Seifer's opinion. But if you go a little further back, if you go to the time of the Ramban, you can't argue with the Ramban. Because the Ramban is in a totally different plane. You can get up early in the morning for a month and work and work and work and work and work, and you're not going to be able to argue with the Ramban. And certainly not with one of the sages of the Talmud. In other words, th th there's an intuition that Klal Yisrael has, and at certain points there's such a drop that the sages that follow that drop are not in the same ballpark as the sages who were before. So it's not just a gradual decline which would allow the later ones to argue with the earlier ones. It's just a totally different story. But even within an era, you find precipitous drafts. And I think that um, when we think of the scholarship of the great rabbis who were before the war in Europe, you think of, of Rav Chaim Eiser, the Vilna Rav, and uh, there's no such thing nowadays. If you're talking about a, a, a quantity and quality of Torah knowledge which is just inconceivable today. Inconceivable today. Even people that, that we've known, and, uh, that I've known in my lifetime, right, but, but met. And I think uh, I've told the story with Ramesha Feinstein about uh, how once there was a group of rabbis in his house and they were meeting. And the uh, Rabbi asked his Rebison to serve cake and refreshments. Uh, he simply so asked, what's the occasion? He said, I have a seum today. Oh, a seum, very nice. Well, what's the seum? He said, I finished Shulchan Aruch for the 400th time. <laughs> the entire thing, the 400th time. 400th time. It's an amazing story. That itself is an amazing story. But his grandson heard the story and asked him, Zadie, how did you keep track of the number of times you did it? So Rabbi says that at a certain point, I decided I would review the entire Shulchan Aruch once a month. I remember when I started, and I calculated this is the 400th month. Well, divide four, by 12, you know, it was like 36 and a third years every month. Remember the Shulchan Aruch? Entire thing. <laughs> <laughs> They tell a story, I mean, you, you, there are thousands of stories like this. But they tell a story that uh, there, there were four rabbis that were in the dacha together. You know what a dacha was? They still on, on, in Russia in the country. Like dacha. That was the big thing. Black Sea. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they went of dacha, they didn't bring svarim with them. They couldn't slap their belongings. So they didn't bring svarim. So, but the rabbis didn't eat svarim. They, they had a lot in their heads. So there were four rabbis. There was Rav Moshe Mordechai, excuse me, three rabbis, Rav Moshe Mordechai, and Rav Yisrael Zalman, Meltzer, the two Slovakia Rosh Yeshiva, and Rav Kook. And they were in the same dacha. And uh, they had no svarim. So they said, listen, we still have to learn. So uh, let each person say a mesechta by heart. A whole tractate of the Talmud by heart, and then we'll, we'll learn by heart. A good idea. So Rabbi Zalman said the entire tractate Yevamus. Well, I'll show you what a Yevamus looks like in the shelf. It's massive. Rabbi Moshe Mordechai said the entire Bava Basra. The Bava Basra is the biggest Masech in the shaft, but um, since you have the Rashbam's commentary, it takes up a lot of space, so the Gemara really is um, is. Uh, not as big as it looks, but it still it's the equivalent of 120 regular black mark by heart. But Rav Kook said the entire Masech Shabbos, which is 157 lot, and they agreed uh, that he won the contest. <laughs> you know, he had done them. I mean, we're talking about something which is just totally beyond our, our imagination. And uh, 
it's a wonderful thing, therefore, you know, if a, a grandchild can learn with a grandfather, sometimes you can bridge that gap. Because you can be one step closer to these great people. But otherwise, you'd be two generations removed from now, you're only one generation removed. And that little difference, the Rebbe Shalom considers a big difference. And says, if you teach your grandson Torah, that's not the natural course. Normally, you would teach your own son, and your son would teach his son. But if you teach your grandson Torah, and therefore he's one step closer, one generation closer to Har Sinai than he should have been, that's Mala all of the cost of In God's eyes, that's Ki'ilu Kivlu Har Sinai, as if he got it from Har Sinai. Because you brought him one generation closer to Har Sinai. So in history, who were the children that uh, experienced this were Ephraim and Manasseh? Right? They were a generation closer than they should have been. Because they really were Yaakov's grandchildren. And instead of Yaakov was Makarev them as if they were his children. That's Ephraim and Manasseh, who were Shimon Yilin. We don't have tell us that Yaakov taught them. He didn't teach Yosef, and Yosef in turn taught them. <laughs> Yaakov was there ready. So they were a generation closer to Abraham, to Yitzchak, than they should have been, because Yaakov taught them directly. And that's the bracha we give our children. In other words, we give our children this bracha that they should be closer. They should be more connected to their past. More connected than the derech they should be. So you say, Ephraim and Manasseh, Yisimach Elokim Kephraim and Manasseh. It's not that Ephraim and Manasseh were the, the greatest people, necessarily, but they had something special about them that no one else ever shared. That they were more closer than they should have been with their hatava. That's a bracha. And that's also, I think, related to the ideas we've been discussing. Whereas, this is a time of gullus. And gullus is a time of disconnection, of becoming detached from your roots. You become detached from your spiritual homeland. You become detached from your spiritual mentors. Right? You're on your own. You're estranged. And everything Yaakov Avinu does is designed to establish a connection, to, to establish a strong attachment. And he's Makar of Ephraim and Manasseh, and he tries to create a connection to Eretz Yisrael. These are the strategies we need to do in, in Gullus. If uh, a person has children and he has the opportunity to take them to meet a Tamil Chacham of an earlier generation, that's an opportunity that shouldn't be passed up. Because uh, this is a way of connecting them to something that they otherwise would have no exposure to, they never get to see. And that's what Yaakov Bino had in, in mind. These are all preparations for the very, very bitter Golos Mitzrayim, which, as Hashem, we will talk about next week.